Chapter Eight of Mother West Wind's Children. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Mother West Wind's Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter Eight. Johnny Chuck's Great Fight. Johnny Chuck sat on the doorstep of his new home, looking away across the green meadows. Johnny Chuck felt very well satisfied with himself and with all the world. He yawned lazily and stretched and stretched and then settled himself comfortably to watch the merry little breezes playing down by the smiling pool. By and by he saw Peter Rabbit go bobbing along down the lone little path. Lipperty-lipperty-lip went Peter Rabbit, and every other jump he looked behind him. "'Now what is Peter Rabbit up to?' said Johnny Chuck to himself. "'And what does he keep looking behind him for?' Johnny Chuck sat up a little straighter to watch Peter Rabbit hop down the lone little path. Then, of a sudden, he caught sight of something that made him sit up straighter than ever and open his eyes very wide. Something was following Peter Rabbit. Yes, sir, something was bobbing along right at Peter Rabbit's heels. Johnny Chuck forgot the Merry Little Breezes. He forgot how warm it was and how lazy he felt. He forgot everything else in his curiosity to learn what it could be following so closely at Peter Rabbit's heels. Presently Peter Rabbit stopped and sat up very straight, and then Johnny Chuck nearly tumbled over in sheer surprise. He rubbed his eyes to make sure that he saw aright, for there were two Peter Rabbits. Yes, sir, there were two Peter Rabbits. Only one was very small, very small indeed. Oh, said Johnny Chuck, that must be Peter Rabbit's baby brother. Then he began to chuckle till his fat sides shook. There sat Peter Rabbit with his funny long ears standing straight up, and there right behind him, dressed exactly like him, sat Peter Rabbit's baby brother, with his funny little long ears standing straight up. When Peter Rabbit wiggled his right ear, his baby brother wiggled his right ear. When Peter Rabbit scratched his left ear, his baby brother scratched his left ear. Whatever Peter Rabbit did, his baby brother did too. Presently Peter Rabbit started on down the lone little path, lipperty-lipperty-lip, and right at his heels went his baby brother, lipperty-lipperty-lip. Johnny Chuck watched them out of sight, and then he settled himself on his doorstep once more to enjoy a sun bath. Every once in a while he chuckled to himself as he remembered how funny Peter Rabbit's baby brother had looked. Presently Johnny Chuck fell asleep. Jolly, round, red Mr. Sun had climbed quite high in the sky when Johnny Chuck awoke. He yawned and stretched and stretched and yawned. And then he sat up to look over the green meadows. Then he became wide awake, very wide awake indeed. Way down on the green meadows he caught a glimpse of something red jumping about in the long meadow grass. That must be Reddy Fox, thought Johnny Chuck. Yes, it surely is Reddy Fox. Now I wonder what mischief he is up to. Then he saw all the merry little breezes racing towards Reddy Fox as fast as they could go. And there was Sammy Jay screaming at the top of his voice, and his cousin Blacky the Crow. Happy Jack Squirrel was dancing up and down excitedly on the branch of an old elm close by. Johnny Chuck waited to see no more, but started down the lone little path to find out what it all was about. Halfway down the lone little path, he met Peter Rabbit running as hard as he could. His long ears were laid flat back, his big eyes seemed to pop right out of his head, and he was running as Johnny Chuck had never seen him run before. "'What are you running so for, Peter Rabbit?' asked Johnny Chuck. "'To get Bowser the Hound!' shouted Peter Rabbit over his shoulder as he tried to run faster. "'Now what can be the matter?' said Johnny Chuck to himself. "'To send Peter Rabbit after Bowser the Hound.' He knew that, like all the other little meadow people, there was nothing of which Peter Rabbit was so afraid as Farmer Brown's great dog, Bowser the Hound. Johnny Chuck hurried down the lone little path as fast as his short legs could take his fat, roly-poly self. Presently he came out onto the green meadows, and there he saw a sight that set every nerve in his round little body a tingle with rage. Reddy Fox had found Peter Rabbit's baby brother, 
and was doing his best to frighten him to death. "'I'm going to eat you now!' shouted Reddy Fox. And then he sprang on Peter Rabbit's baby brother and gave him a cuff that sent him heels over head sprawling in the grass. "'Coward! Coward, Reddy Fox!' shrieked Sammy Jay. "'Shame! Shame!' shouted the Merry Little Breezes. "'You're nothing but a great big bully!' yelled Blacky the Crow. But no one did anything to help Peter Rabbit's baby brother, for Reddy Fox is so much bigger than any of the rest of them, except Bobby Coon, that all the little meadow people are afraid of him. But Reddy Fox just laughed at them, and nipped the long ears of Peter Rabbit's little brother so hard that he cried with the pain. Now all were so intent watching Reddy Fox torment the baby brother of Peter Rabbit that no one had seen Johnny Chuck coming down the lone little path. And for a few minutes no one recognized the furious little yellow-brown bundle that suddenly knocked Reddy Fox over and seized him by the throat. You see, it didn't look a bit like Johnny Chuck. Every hair was standing on end, he was so mad, and this made him appear twice as big as they had ever seen him before. "'Coward! Coward! Coward!' shrieked Johnny Chuck as he shook Reddy Fox by the throat, and then began the greatest fight that the Green Meadows had ever seen. Now Johnny Chuck is not naturally a fighter. Oh my, no! He is so good-natured and so sunny-hearted that he seldom quarrels with anyone. But when he has to fight, there isn't a cowardly hair on him, not the teeniest weeniest one. No one ever has a chance to cry, frayed cat cry baby, after Johnny Chuck. So though, like all the other little meadow people, he was usually just a little afraid of Reddy Fox, because Reddy is so much bigger, he forgot all about it as soon as he caught sight of Reddy Fox tormenting Peter Rabbit's little brother. He didn't stop to think of what might happen to himself. He didn't stop to think at all. He just gritted his teeth, and in a flash had Reddy Fox on his back. Such a fight was never seen before on the Green Meadows. Reddy Fox is a bully and a coward, for he never fights with anyone of his own size if he can help it. But when he has to fight, he fights hard, and he certainly had to fight now. Bully! hissed Johnny Chuck, as with his stout little hind feet he ripped the bright red coat of Reddy Fox. You great big bully! Over and over they rolled, Johnny Chuck on top, then Reddy Fox on top, then Johnny Chuck up again, clawing and snarling. It seemed as if news of the fight had gone over all the green meadows, for the little meadow people came running from every direction. Billy Mink, Little Joe Otter, Jerry Muskrat, Striped Chipmunk, Jimmy Skunk, Old Mr. Toad, even Great Grandfather Frog, who left his big lily pad and came hurrying with great jumps across the green meadows. They formed a ring around Reddy Fox and Johnny Chuck, and danced with excitement, and all wanted Johnny Chuck to win. Peter Rabbit's poor little brother, so sore and lame from the knocking about from Reddy Fox, and so frightened that he hardly dared breathe, lay flat on the ground under a little bush, and was forgotten by all but the merry little breezes, who covered him up with some dead grass, and kissed him, and whispered to him not to be afraid now. How Peter Rabbit's little brother did hope that Johnny Chuck would win. His great, big, round, soft eyes were wide with terror as he thought of what might happen to him if Reddy Fox should whip Johnny Chuck. But Reddy Fox wasn't whipping Johnny Chuck. Try as he would, he could not get a good hold on that round, fat little body. And Johnny Chuck's stout claws were ripping his red coat and white vest and Johnny Chuck's sharp teeth were gripping him so that they could not be shaken loose. Pretty soon Reddy Fox began to think of nothing but getting away. Everyone was shouting for Johnny Chuck. Every time Reddy Fox was underneath, he would hear a great shout from all the little meadow people, and he knew that they were glad. Now Johnny Chuck was round and fat and roly-poly, and when one is round and fat and roly-poly, one's breath is apt to be short. So it was with Johnny Chuck. He had fought so hard that his breath was nearly gone. Finally he loosed his hold on Reddy Fox for just a second to draw in a good breath. 
Reddy Fox saw his chance, and with a quick pull and spring he broke away. How all the little meadow people did scatter! You see, they were very brave, very brave indeed, so long as Johnny Chuck had Reddy Fox down. But now that Reddy Fox was free, each one was suddenly afraid and thought only of himself. Jimmy Skunk knocked Jerry Muskrat flat in his hurry to get away. Billy Mink trod on Great Grandfather Frog's big feet and didn't even say, Excuse me. Striped Chipmunk ran head first into a big thistle and squealed as much from fear as pain. But Reddy Fox paid no attention to any of them. He just wanted to get away, and off he started, limping as fast as he could go up the lone little path. Such a looking sight! His beautiful red coat was in tatters. His face was scratched. He hobbled as he ran. And just as he broke away, Johnny Chuck made a grab and pulled a great mouthful of hair out of the splendid tail Reddy Fox was so proud of. When the little meadow people saw that Reddy Fox was actually running away, they stopped running themselves, and all began to shout, Reddy Fox is a coward and a bully! Coward! Coward! Then they crowded around Johnny Chuck, and all began talking at once about his great fight. Just then they heard a great noise up on the hill. They saw Reddy Fox coming back down the lone little path, and he was using his legs just as well as he knew how. Right behind him, his great mouth open and waking all the echoes with his big voice, was Bowser the Hound. You see, although Peter Rabbit couldn't fight for his little brother and is usually very, very timid, he isn't altogether a coward. Indeed, he had been very brave, very brave indeed. He had gone up to Farmer Brown's and had jumped right under the nose of Bowser the Hound. Now that is something that Bowser the Hound never can stand. So off he had started after Peter Rabbit. And Peter Rabbit had started back for the Green Meadows as fast as his long legs could take him, for he knew that if once Bowser the Hound caught sight of Reddy Fox, he would forget all about such a little thing as a saucy rabbit. Sure enough, halfway down the lone little path, they met Reddy Fox sneaking off home. And when Bowser the Hound saw him, he straightway forgot all about Peter Rabbit, and with a great roar, started after Reddy Fox. When Johnny Chuck had carefully brushed his coat, and all the little meadow people had wished him good luck, he started off up the lone little path for home, the merry little breezes dancing ahead, and Peter Rabbit coming lipperty-lipperty-lip behind and right between them hopped Peter Rabbit's little brother, who thought Johnny Chuck the greatest hero in the world. When they reached Johnny Chuck's old home, Peter Rabbit and Peter Rabbit's little brother tried to tell him how thankful they were to him. But Johnny Chuck just laughed and said, It was nothing at all, just nothing at all. When at last all had gone, even the merry little breezes, Johnny Chuck slipped away to his new home, which is his secret, you know, which no one knows but jolly round red Mr. Sun, who won't tell. I hope, said Johnny Chuck, as he stretched himself out on the mound of warm sand by his doorway, for he was very tired. I hope, said Johnny Chuck, sighing contentedly, that Reddy Fox got away from Bowser the Hound. And Reddy Fox did. End of chapter 8《Twins Children》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Mother West Wind's Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 9 Mr. Toad's Old Suit. Peter Rabbit was tired and very sleepy as he hopped along the crooked little path down the hill. He could see Old Mother West Wind just emptying her merry little breezes out of her big bag onto the green meadows to play all the bright summer day. Peter Rabbit yawned and yawned again as he watched them dance over to the smiling pool. Then he hopped on down the crooked little path towards home. Sammy Jay, sitting on a fence post, saw him coming. Peter Rabbit out all night. Oh, my goodness, what a sight. Peter Rabbit reprobate. No good end will be your fate, shouted Sammy Jay. Peter Rabbit ran out his tongue at Sammy Jay. Who stole Happy Jack's nuts? Thief, 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 shouted Peter Rabbit at Sammy Jay, 
and kept on down the crooked little path. It was true, Peter Rabbit had been out all night playing in the moonlight, stealing a midnight feast in Farmer Brown's cabbage patch, and getting into mischief with Bobby Coon. Now, when most of the little meadow people were just waking up, Peter Rabbit was thinking of bed. Presently he came to a big piece of bark, which is the roof of Mr. Toad's house. Mr. Toad was sitting in his doorway, blinking at jolly, round, red Mr. Sun, who had just begun to climb up the sky. "'Good morning, Mr. Toad,' said Peter Rabbit. "'Good morning,' said Mr. Toad. "'You're looking very fine this morning, Mr. Toad,' said Peter Rabbit. "'I'm feeling very fine this morning,' said Mr. Toad. "'Why, my gracious, you have on a new suit, Mr. Toad,' exclaimed Peter Rabbit. "'Well, what if I have, Peter Rabbit?' demanded Mr. Toad. "'Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing at all, Mr. Toad, nothing at all,' said Peter Rabbit hastily. "'Only I didn't know you ever had a new suit. "'What have you done with your old suit, Mr. Toad?' "'Swallowed it,' said Mr. Toad shortly, turning his back on Peter Rabbit. "'And that was all Peter Rabbit could get out of Mr. Toad, "'so he started on down the crooked little path. Now, Peter Rabbit has a great deal of curiosity, and is forever poking into other people's affairs. The more he thought about it, the more he wondered what Mr. Toad could have done with his old suit. Of course he hadn't swallowed it. Who ever heard of such a thing? The more he thought of it, the more Peter Rabbit felt that he must know what Mr. Toad had done with his old suit. By this time he had forgotten that he had been out all night. He had forgotten that he was sleepy. He had got to find out about Mr. Toad's old suit. "'I'll just run over to the Smiling Pool and ask Grandfather Frog. He'll surely know what Mr. Toad does with his old suits,' said Peter Rabbit, and began to hop faster. When he reached the Smiling Pool, there sat Great Grandfather Frog on his big green lily pad as usual. There was a hungry look in his big goggly eyes, for it was so early that no foolish green flies had come his way yet. But Peter Rabbit was too full of curiosity in Mr. Toad's affairs to notice this. "'Good morning, Grandfather Frog,' said Peter Rabbit. "'Good morning,' replied Grandfather Frog, a wee bit gruffly. "'You're looking very fine this morning, Grandfather Frog,' said Peter Rabbit. "'Not so fine as I'd feel if I had a few fat, foolish green flies,' said Grandfather Frog. "'I've just met your cousin, Mr. Toad, and he has on a new suit,' said Peter Rabbit. "'Indeed,' replied Grandfather Frog. "'Well, I think it's high time.' "'What does Mr. Toad do with his old suit, Grandfather Frog?' asked Peter Rabbit. "'Chug a rum. It's none of my business. Maybe he swallows it,' replied Grandfather Frog crossly, and turned his back on Peter Rabbit. Peter Rabbit saw that his curiosity must remain unsatisfied. He suddenly remembered that he had been out all night and was very, very sleepy, so he started off home across the green meadows. Now the Merry Little Breezes had heard all that Peter Rabbit and Grandfather Frog had said, and they made up their minds that they would find out from Grandfather Frog what Mr. Toad really did do with his old suit. First of all they scattered over the green meadows. Presently back they all came, each blowing ahead of him a fat, foolish green fly. Right over to the big green lily pad they blew the green flies. Chug-a-rum, 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 said Grandfather Frog, as each fat, foolish green fly disappeared inside his white and yellow waistcoat. When the last one was out of sight, all but a leg which was left sticking out of a corner of Grandfather Frog's big mouth, one of the Merry Little Breezes ventured to ask him what became of Mr. Toad's old suit. Grandfather Frog settled himself comfortably on the big green lily pad, and folded his hands across his white and yellow waistcoat. Chug a rum, began Grandfather Frog. Once upon a time, the Merry Little Breezes clapped their hands and settled themselves among the buttercups and daisies for they knew that soon they would know what Mr. Toad did with his old suit. Once upon a time, 
began Grandfather Frog again. When the world was young, Old King Bear received word that Old Mother Nature would visit the Green Meadows and the Green Forest. Of course, Old King Bear wanted his kingdom and his subjects to look their very best. So he issued a royal order that every one of the little meadow people and every one of the little forest folk should wear a new suit on the day that Old Mother Nature was to pay her visit. Now, like Old King Bear, every one wanted to appear his very best before Old Mother Nature. But as no one knew the exact day she was to come, every one began at once to wear his best suit and to take the greatest care of it. Old King Bear appeared every day in a suit of glossy black. Lightfoot the deer threw away his dingy gray suit and put on a coat of beautiful red and fawn. Mr. Mink, Mr. Otter, Mr. Muskrat, Mr. Rabbit, Mr. Woodchuck, Mr. Coon, who you know was first cousin to Old King Bear, Mr. Gray Squirrel, Mr. Fox Squirrel, Mr. Red Squirrel, all put on brand new suits. Mr. Skunk changed his black and white stripes for a suit of all black, very handsome, very handsome indeed. Mr. Chipmunk took care to see that his new suit had the most beautiful stripes to be obtained. Mr. Jay, who was something of a dandy, had a wonderful new coat that looked for all the world as if it had been cut from the bluest patch of sky and trimmed with edging taken from the whitest clouds. Even Mr. Crow and Mr. Owl took pains to look their very best. But Mr. Toad couldn't see the need of such a fuss. He thought his neighbors spent altogether too much time and thought on dress. To be sure, he was anxious to look his best when Old Mother Nature came, so he got a new suit all ready. But Mr. Toad couldn't afford to sit around in idleness admiring his new clothes. No, indeed. Mr. Toad had too much to do. He was altogether too busy. He had a large garden to take care of, had Mr. Toad, and work in a garden is very hard on clothes. So Mr. Toad just wore his old suit over his new one and went on about his business. By and by the great day came when Old Mother Nature arrived to inspect the kingdom of Old King Bear. All the little meadow people and all the little forest folk hastened to pay their respects to Old Mother Nature and to strut about in their fine clothes, all but Mr. Toad. He was so busy that he didn't even know that Old Mother Nature had arrived. Late in the afternoon, Mr. Toad stopped to rest. He had just cleared his cabbage patch of the slugs which threatened to eat up his crop, and he was very tired. Presently he happened to look up the road, and who should he see but Old Mother Nature herself, coming to visit his garden, and to find out why Mr. Toad had not been to pay her his respects. Suddenly Mr. Toad remembered that he had on his working clothes, which were very old, very dirty, and very ragged. For just a minute he didn't know what to do. Then he dived under a cabbage leaf and began to pull off his old suit. But the old suit stuck. He was in such a hurry and so excited that he couldn't find the buttons. Finally he got his trousers off. Then he reached over and got hold of the back of his coat, and tugged and hauled, until finally he pulled his old coat off right over his head, just as if it were a shirt. Mr. Toad gave a great sigh of relief as he stepped out in his new suit, for you remember that he had been wearing that new suit underneath the old one all the time. Mr. Toad was very well pleased with himself until he thought how terribly untidy that ragged old suit looked lying on the ground. What should he do with it? He couldn't hide it in the garden, for old Mother Nature's eyes are so sharp that she would be sure to see it. What should he do? Then Mr. Toad had a happy thought. Everyone made fun of his big mouth. But what was a big mouth for if not to use? He would swallow his old suit. In a flash, Mr. Toad dived under the cabbage leaf and crammed his old suit into his mouth. When Old Mother Nature came into the garden, Mr. Toad was waiting in the path to receive her. Very fine he looked in his new suit, and you would have thought he had been waiting all day to receive Old Mother Nature, but for one thing. Swallow as much and as hard as he would, he couldn't get down quite all of his old suit, and a leg of his trousers hung out of a corner of his big mouth. 
Of course Old Mother Nature saw it right away, and how she did laugh. And of course Mr. Toad felt very much mortified. But Mother Nature was so pleased with Mr. Toad's garden and with Mr. Toad's industry that she quite overlooked the ragged trousers leg hanging from the corner of Mr. Toad's mouth. Fine clothes are not to be compared with fine work, said Old Mother Nature. I herewith appoint you my chief gardener, Mr. Toad, and as a sign that all may know that this is so, hereafter you shall always swallow your old suit whenever you change your clothes. And from that day to this the toads have been the very best of gardeners, and in memory of their great, great, great grandfather a thousand times removed, they have always swallowed their old suits. Now you know what my cousin, old Mr. Toad, did with his old suit, just before Peter Rabbit passed his house this morning, concluded Great Grandfather Frog. Oh, cried the Merry Little Breezes, thank you, thank you, Grandfather Frog. Then they raced away across the green meadows and up the crooked little path to see if old Mr. Toad was gardening. And Peter Rabbit still wonders what old Mr. Toad did with his old suit. End of chapter 9《Of Mother West Wind's Children》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Mother West Wind's Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 10 Grandfather Frog Gets Even. Old Grandfather Frog sat on his big green lily pad in the smiling pool, dreaming of the days when the world was young and the frogs ruled the world. His hands were folded across his white and yellow waistcoat. Round, red, smiling Mr. Sun sent down his warmest rays on the back of Grandfather Frog's green coat. Very early that morning, Old Mother West Wind, hurrying down from the Purple Hills on her way to help the white-sailed ships across the great ocean, had stopped long enough to blow three or four fat, foolish green flies over to the big lily pad, and they were now safely inside the white and yellow waistcoat. A thousand little tadpoles, the great-great-grandchildren of Grandfather Frog, were playing in the smiling pool, and every once in a while wriggling up to the big lily pad to look with awe at Grandfather Frog and wonder if they would ever be as handsome and big and wise as he. And still old Grandfather Frog sat, dreaming and dreaming of the days when all the frogs had tails and ruled the world. Presently Billy Mink came hopping and skipping down the laughing brook. Sometimes he swam a little way, and sometimes he ran a little way along the bank, and sometimes he jumped from stone to stone. Billy Mink was feeling very good, very good indeed. He had caught a fine fat trout for breakfast. He had hidden two more away for dinner in a snug little hole no one knew of but himself. Now he had nothing to do but get into mischief. You can always depend upon Billy Mink to get into mischief. He just can't help it. So Billy Mink came hopping and skipping down the laughing brook to the smiling pool. Then he stopped as still as the rock he was standing on, and peeped through the bulrushes. Billy Mink is very cautious, very cautious indeed. He always looks well before he shows himself, that nothing may surprise him. So Billy Mink looked all over the smiling pool and the grassy banks. He saw the sunbeams dancing on the water. He saw the tadpoles having such a good time in the smiling pool. He saw the merry little breezes kissing the buttercups and daisies on the bank. And he saw old Grandfather Frog, with his hands folded across his white and yellow waistcoat, sitting on the green lily pad, dreaming of the days when the world was young. Then Billy Mink took a long breath, a very long breath, and dived into the smiling pool. Now Billy Mink can swim very fast, very fast indeed. For a little way he can swim even faster than Mr. Trout, and he can stay under water a long time. Straight across the smiling pool, with not even the tip of his nose out of water, swam Billy Mink. The thousand little tadpoles saw him coming and fled in all directions to bury themselves in the mud at the bottom of the smiling pool. For when he thinks no one is looking, Billy Mink sometimes gobbles up a fat tadpole for breakfast. Straight across the smiling pool swam Billy Mink toward the big green lily pad where Grandfather Frog sat, dreaming of the days when the world was young. When he was right under the big green lily pad, he suddenly kicked up hard with his hind feet. 
Up went the big green lily pad, and, of course, up went Grandfather Frog, up and over, flat on his back, with a great splash into the smiling pool. Now Grandfather Frog's mouth is very big. Indeed, no one else has so big a mouth, unless it be his cousin, old Mr. Toad. And when Grandfather Frog went over flat on his back, splash in the smiling pool, his mouth was wide open. You see, he was so surprised, he forgot to close it. So, of course, Grandfather Frog swallowed a great deal of water, and he choked and spluttered and swam around in foolish little circles, trying to find himself. Finally, he climbed out on his big green lily pad. Chug a rum, said Grandfather Frog, and looked this way and looked that way. Then he gave a funny hop and turned about in the opposite direction and looked this way and looked that way. But all he saw was the smiling pool dimpling and smiling, Mrs. Redwing bringing a fat worm to her hungry little babies in their snug nest in the bulrushes, and the merry little breezes hurrying over to see what the trouble might be. Chug-a-rum, said Grandfather Frog. It is very strange. I must have fallen asleep and had a bad dream. Then he once more settled himself comfortably on the big green lily pad, folded his hands across his white and yellow waistcoat, and seemed to be dreaming again. Only his big goggly eyes were not dreaming. No, indeed. They were very much awake, and they saw all that was going on in the smiling pool. Great-grandfather Frog was just pretending. You may fool him once, but Grandfather Frog has lived so long that he has become very wise. And though Billy Mink is very smart, it takes someone a great deal smarter than Billy Mink to fool Grandfather Frog twice in the same way. Billy Mink, hiding behind the big rock, had laughed and laughed till he had to hold his sides when Grandfather Frog had choked and spluttered and hopped about on the big lily pad, trying to find out what it all meant. He thought it such a good joke that he couldn't keep it to himself. So when he saw little Joe Otter coming to try his slippery slide, he swam across to tell him all about it. Little Joe Otter laughed and laughed until he had to hold his sides. Then they both swam back to hide behind the big rock to watch until Grandfather Frog should forget all about it and they could play the trick over again. Now out of the corner of one of his big goggly eyes, Grandfather Frog had seen Billy Mink and Little Joe Otter with their heads close together, laughing and holding their sides, and he saw them swim over behind the big rock. Pretty soon one of the Merry Little Breezes danced over to see if Grandfather Frog had really gone to sleep. Grandfather Frog didn't move, not the teeniest, weeniest bit, but he whispered something to the Merry Little Breeze and the Merry Little Breeze flew away, shaking with laughter, to where the other Merry Little Breezes were playing with the buttercups and daisies. Then all the Merry Little Breezes clapped their hands and laughed, too. They left the buttercups and daisies and began to play tag across the smiling pool. Now right on the edge of the big rock lay a big stick. Pretty soon the Merry Little Breezes danced over to the big rock. And then, suddenly, all together they gave the big stick a push. Off it went, and then such a splashing and squealing as there was behind the big rock. In a few moments, Little Joe Otter crept out beside his slippery slide and slipped away, holding on to his head. And sneaking through the bulrushes, so as not to be seen, crawled Billy Mink back towards his home on the Laughing Brook. Billy Mink wasn't laughing now. Oh, no. He was limping, and he was holding on to his head. Little Joe Otter and Billy Mink had been sitting right underneath the big stick. Chug-a-rum, said Grandfather Frog, and held on to his sides and opened his mouth very wide in a noiseless laugh, for Grandfather Frog never makes a sound when he laughs. Chug-a-rum, said Grandfather Frog once more. Then he folded his hands across his white and yellow waistcoat, and began again to dream of the days when the frogs had long tails and ruled the world. End of chapter 10
It looked a whole lot like other little bushes all around it, but really it was quite different, as you shall see. When in the spring warm, jolly, round Mr. Sun brought back the birds and set them singing, when the little flowers popped their heads out of the ground to have a look around, then all the little bushes put out their green leaves. This little bush of which I am telling you put out its green leaves with the rest. The little leaves grew bigger and bigger on all the little bushes. By and by, on some of the other little bushes, little brown buds began to appear, and grow and grow. Then, on more and more of the little bushes, the little brown buds came, and grew and grew. But on this little bush of which I am telling you, no little brown buds appeared. The little bush felt very sad indeed. Pretty soon, all the little brown buds on the other little brown bushes burst their brown coats, and then all the little bushes were covered with little flowers. Some were white, and some were yellow, and some were pink, and the air was filled with the sweet odor of all the little flowers. It brought the bees from far, far away to gather the honey, and all the little bushes were very happy indeed. But the little bush of which I am telling you had no little flowers, for you see it had had no little buds, and it felt lonely and shut away from the other little bushes, and very sad indeed. But it bravely kept on growing and growing and growing. Its little leaves grew bigger and bigger and bigger, and it tried its best not to mind because it had no little flowers. Then one by one, and two by two, and three by three, and finally in whole showers, the little flowers of all the other little bushes fell off, and they looked very much like the little bush of which I am telling you, so that the little bush no longer felt sad. All summer long all the little bushes grew and grew and grew. The birds came and built their nests among them. Peter Rabbit and his brothers and sisters scampered under them. The butterflies flew over them. By and by came the fall, and with the fall came Jack Frost. He went about among the little bushes, pinching the leaves. Then the little green leaves turned to brown and red and yellow, and pretty soon they fluttered down to the ground, the merry little breezes blew them about, and all the little bushes were bare. They had no leaves at all to cover their little naked brown limbs. The little bush of which I am telling you lost its leaves with the rest. But all the summer long this little bush had been growing some of those little brown buds which the other bushes had had in the spring. And now, when all the other little bushes had lost all the green leaves, and had nothing at all upon their little brown twigs, behold! One beautiful day, the little bush, of which I am telling you, was covered with gold, for each little brown bud had burst its little brown coat, and there was a beautiful little yellow flower. Such a multitude of these little yellow flowers! They covered the little bush from top to bottom. Then the little bush felt very happy indeed, for it was the only bush which had any flowers, and every one who passed that way stopped to look at it and to praise it. Colder grew the weather, and colder. Johnny Chuck tucked himself away to sleep all winter. Grandfather Frog went deep, deep down in the mud, not to come out again until spring. By and by the little yellow flowers dropped off the little bush, just as the other little flowers in spring had dropped off the other bushes. But they left behind them tiny little packages, one for every little flower that had been on the bush. All winter long these little packages clung to the little bush. In the spring, when the little leaves burst forth in all the little bushes, these little packages, on the little bush of which I am telling you, grew and grew and grew. While the other little bushes had a lot of little flowers, as they had had the year before, these little brown packages, on the little bush of which I am telling you, kept on growing. And they comforted the little bush, because it felt that it really had something worth while. All the summer long the little brown packages grew and grew until they looked like little nuts. When the fall came again, and all the little leaves dropped off all the little bushes, and the little bush of which I am telling you was covered with another lot of little yellow flowers and was very happy, then these little brown nuts, one bright autumn day, suddenly popped open, and out of each one flew two brown, shiny little seeds. You never saw such a popping and a snapping and a jumping. Pop! Pop, snap, snap, hippity-hop they went, faster than the corn pops in the corn popper. Reddy Fox, who always is suspicious, thought someone was shooting at him. 
Down on the ground fell the little brown shining seeds, and tucked themselves into the warm earth under the warm leaves, there to stay all winter long. And when the third spring came, with all its little birds, and all its little flowers, and the warm sunshine, every one of these little brown seeds, which had tucked themselves into the warm earth, burst its little brown skin, and up into the sunshine came a little green plant, which would grow and grow and grow, and by and by become just like the little bush I am telling you about. When the little bush looked down and saw all these little green children popping out of the ground, it was very happy indeed, for it knew that it would no longer be lonely. It no longer felt bad when all the other bushes were covered with flowers, for it knew that by and by, when all the other little bushes had lost all their leaves and all their flowers, then would come its turn, and it knew that for a whole year its little brown children would be held safe on its branches. Now what do you think is the name of this little bush? Why, it is the witch hazel. And sometimes, when you fall down and bump yourself hard, Grandma will go to the medicine closet and will bring out a bottle. And from that bottle she will pour something on that little sore place, and it will make it feel better. Do you know what it is? It is the gift of the witch hazel bush to little boys and big men to make them feel better when they are hurt. End of chapter 11「Of Mother West Wind's Children」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Mother West Wind's Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 12. Why Bobby Coon Washes His Food Happy-go-lucky Bobby Coon sat on the edge of the laughing brook just as round, red Mr. Sun popped up from behind the purple hills, and old Mother West Wind turned all her merry little breezes out to romp on the green meadows. Bobby Coon had been out all night. You see, Bobby Coon is very apt to get into mischief, and because usually it is safer to get into mischief under cover of the darkness, Bobby Coon prefers the night wherein to go abroad. Not that Bobby Coon is really bad. Oh my, no. Everybody likes Bobby Coon. But he can no more keep out of mischief than a duck can keep out of water. So Bobby Coon sat on the edge of the laughing brook, and he was very busy very busy indeed. He was washing his breakfast. Really, it was his dinner, for turning night into day just turns everything topsy-turvy. So Bobby Coon eats dinner when most of the little meadow people are eating breakfast. This morning he was very busy washing a luscious ear of sweet corn just in the milk. He dipped it in the water and with one little black paw rubbed it thoroughly. Then he looked it over carefully before, with a sigh of contentment, he sat down to put it in his empty little stomach. When he had finished it to the last sweet, juicy kernel, he ambled sleepily up the lone little path to the big hollow chestnut tree where he lives, and in its great hollow, in a soft bed of leaves, Bobby Coon curled himself up in a tight little ball to sleep the long, bright day away. One of the merry little breezes softly followed him. When he had crawled into the hollow chestnut, and only his funny ringed tail hung out, the merry little breeze tweaked it sharply just for fun, and then danced away down the lone little path to join the other merry little breezes around the smiling pool. "'Oh, Grandfather Frog,' cried a merry little breeze, "'tell us why it is that Bobby Coon always washes his food. He never eats it where he gets it or takes it home to his hollow in the big chestnut, but always comes to the laughing brook to wash it. None of the other meadow people do that.' Now Great Grandfather Frog is counted very wise. He is very, very old, and he knows the history of all the tribes of the little meadow people, way back to the time when the frogs ruled the world. When the merry little breeze asked him why Bobby Coon always washes his food, Grandfather Frog stopped to snap up a particularly fat, foolish green fly that came his way. Then, while all the merry little breezes gathered around him, he settled himself on his big green lily pad and began. Once upon a time, when the world was young, old King Bear ruled in the green forest. Of course old Mother Nature, who was even more beautiful then than she is now, was the real ruler, but she let old King Bear think he ruled so long as he ruled wisely. 
All the little green forest folk and all the little people of the green meadows used to take presents of food to old King Bear, so that he never had to hunt for things to eat. He grew fatter and fatter and fatter, until it seemed as if his skin must burst. And the fatter he grew, the lazier he grew. Grandfather Frog paused with an expectant, faraway look in his great bulging eyes. Then he leaped into the air so far that when he came down it was with a great splash in the smiling pool. But as he swam back to his big lily pad, the leg of a foolish green fly could be seen sticking out of one corner of his big mouth, and he settled himself with a sigh of great contentment. Old King Bear, continued Grandfather Frog, just as if there had been no interruption, grew fatter and lazier every day. And like a great many other fat and lazy people who have nothing to do for themselves, but are always waited on by others, he grew shorter and shorter in temper, and harder and harder to please. Now perhaps you don't know it, but the Bear family and the Coon family are very closely related. In fact, they are second cousins. Old Mr. Coon, Bobby Coon's father with a thousand greats tacked on before, was young then, and he was very, very proud of being related to old King Bear. He began to pass some of his old playfellows on the green meadows without seeing them. He spent a great deal of time brushing his coat and combing his whiskers and caring for his big ringed tail. He held his head very high, and he put on such airs that pretty soon he could see no one at all but members of his own family and of the royal family of Bear. Now as old King Bear grew fat and lazy, he grew fussy, so that he was no longer content to take everything brought him, but picked out the choicest portions for himself, and left the rest. Mr. Coon took charge of all the things brought as tribute to old King Bear, and of course where there were so many goodies left, he got all he wanted without working. So just as old King Bear had grown fat and lazy and selfish, Mr. Coon grew fat and lazy and selfish. Pretty soon he began to pick out the best things for himself and hide them before old King Bear saw them. When old King Bear was asleep, he would go get them and stuff himself like a greedy pig. And because he was stealing and wanted no one to see him, he always ate his stolen feasts at night. Now old Mother Nature is, as you all know, very, very wise. Oh, very wise indeed. One of the first laws she made when the world was young is that every living thing shall work for what it has, and the harder it works, the stronger it shall grow. So when Old Mother Nature saw how fat and lazy and selfish Old King Bear was getting, and how fat and lazy and dishonest his cousin Mr. Coon was becoming, she determined that they should be taught a lesson which they would remember for ever and ever and ever. First she proclaimed that old King Bear should be king no longer, and no more need the little folks of the green forest and the little people of the green meadows bring him tribute. Now when old Mother Nature made this proclamation, old King Bear was fast asleep. It was just on the edge of winter, and he had picked out a nice warm cave with a great pile of leaves for a bed. Old Mother Nature peeped in at him. He was snoring and probably dreaming of more good things to eat. If he is to be king no longer, there is no use in waking him now, said old Mother Nature to herself. He is so fat and so stupid. He shall sleep until gentle Sister South Wind comes in the spring to kiss away the snow and ice. Then he shall waken with a lean stomach and a great appetite, and there shall be none to feed him. Now old Mother Nature always has a warm heart, and she was very fond of Bobby Coon's grandfather a thousand times removed. So when she saw what a selfish glutton and thief he had become, she decided to put him to sleep just as she had old King Bear. But first she would teach Mr. Coon that stolen food is not the sweetest. So old Mother Nature found some tender, juicy corn just in the milk which Mr. Coon had stolen from old King Bear. Then she went down on the green meadows where the wild mustard grows and gathering a lot of this, she rubbed the juice into the corn, and then put it back where Mr. Coon had left it. Now I have told you that it was night when Mr. Coon had his stolen feasts, for he wanted no one to see him. 
so no one was there when he took a great bite of the tender, juicy corn Old Mother Nature had put back for him. Being greedy and a glutton, he swallowed the first mouthful before he had fairly tasted it, and took a second. And then such a time as there was on the edge of the green forest. Mr. Coon rolled over and over with both of his forepaws clasped over his stomach, and groaned and groaned and groaned. He had rubbed his eyes, and of course had got mustard into them, and could not see. He waked up all the little green forest folk who sleep through the night, as good people should, and they all gathered around to see what was the matter with Mr. Coon. Finally old Mother Nature came to his relief, and brought him some water. Then she led him to his home in the great hollow in the big chestnut tree, and when she had seen him curled up in a tight little ball among the dried leaves, she put him into the long sleep, as she had old King Bear. In the spring, when gentle Sister South Wind kissed away all the snow and ice, old King Bear, who was king no longer, and Mr. Coon awoke, and both were very thin, and both were very hungry, oh, very, very hungry indeed. Old King Bear, who was king no longer, wasn't the least mite fussy about what he had to eat, but ate gladly any food he could find. But Mr. Coon remembered the burning of his stomach and mouth, and could not forget it. So whenever he found anything to eat, he first took it to the laughing brook or the smiling pool, and washed it very carefully, lest there be some mustard on it. And ever since that long ago time, when the world was young, the Coon family has remembered that experience of Mr. Coon, who was second cousin to old King Bear. And that is why Bobby Coon washes his food, travels about at night, and sleeps all winter, concluded Grandfather Frog, fixing his great goggle eyes on a foolish green fly headed his way. Oh, thank you, thank you, Grandfather Frog, cried the Merry Little Breezes as they danced away over the green meadows. But one of them slipped back long enough to get behind the foolish green fly and blow him right up to Grandfather Frog's big lily pad. chug a -rum said Grandfather Frog, smacking his lips. End of chapter 12《of Mother West Wind's Children》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Laurie N. Walden. — Mother West Wind's Children by Thornton W. Burgess Chapter 13 — The Merry Little Breezes Have a Busy Day Old Mother West Wind came down from the purple hills in the shadowy coolness of the early morning, before even jolly, round, red Mr. Sun had thrown off his rosy coverlids for his daily climb up through the blue sky. The last little star was blinking sleepily as Old Mother West Wind turned her big bag upside down on the green meadows, and all her children, the merry little breezes, tumbled out on the soft green grass. Then Old Mother West Wind kissed them all around, and hurried away to hunt for a rain cloud which had gone astray. The Merry Little Breezes watched her go. Then they played hide-and-seek, until jolly, round, red Mr. Sun had climbed out of bed and was smiling down on the green meadows. Pretty soon along came Peter Rabbit, lipperty-lipperty-lip. "'Hello, Peter Rabbit,' shouted the Merry Little Breezes. "'Come play with us.' "'Can't,' said Peter Rabbit. I have to go find some tender young carrots for my breakfast. And away he hurried, lipperty-lipperty-lip. In a few minutes Jimmy Skunk came in sight, and he seemed to be almost hurrying along the crooked little path down the hill. The merry little breezes danced over to meet him. "'Hello, Jimmy Skunk,' they cried. "'Come play with us.' Jimmy Skunk shook his head. "'Can't,' said he. "'I have to go look for some beetles for my breakfast.' And off he went, looking under every old stick, and pulling over every stone not too big for his strength. The Merry Little Breezes watched him for a few minutes, and then raced over to the Laughing Brook. There they found Billy Mink stealing softly down towards the Smiling Pool. "'Oh, Billy Mink, come play with us,' begged the Merry Little Breezes. "'Can't,' said Billy Mink. "'I have to catch a trout for Grandfather Mink's breakfast.' And he crept on towards the Smiling Pool." Just then along came Bumble the Bee. Now Bumble the Bee is a lazy fellow who always makes a great fuss as if he was the busiest and most important fellow in the world. "'Good morning, Bumble,' 
cried the Merry Little Breezes. Come play with us. Buzz, 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 grumbled Bumble the Bee. Can't, for I have to get a sack of honey. And off he hurried to the nearest dandelion. Then the Merry Little Breezes hunted up Johnny Chuck. But Johnny Chuck was busy, too busy to play. Bobby Coon was asleep, for he had been out all night. Reddy Fox also was asleep. Striped Chipmunk was in such a hurry to fill the pockets in his cheeks that he could hardly stop to say good morning. Happy Jack Squirrel just flirted his big tail and rushed away as if he had many important things to attend to. Finally the Merry Little Breezes gave it up and sat down among the buttercups and daisies to talk it over. Everyone seemed to have something to do, everyone but themselves. It was such a busy world that sunshiny morning. Pretty soon one of the Merry Little Breezes hopped up very suddenly and began the maddest little dance among the buttercups. "'As we haven't anything to do for ourselves, let's do something for somebody else,' he shouted. Up jumped all the little breezes, clapping their hands. "'Oh, let's!' they shouted. Way over across the green meadows they could see two long ears above the nodding daisies. "'There's Peter Rabbit,' cried one. "'Let's help him find those tender young carrots.' No sooner proposed than off they all raced to see who could reach Peter first. Peter was sitting up very straight, looking this way and looking that way for some tender young carrots, but not one had he found, and his stomach was empty. The merry little breezes stopped just long enough to tickle his long ears and pull his whiskers. Then away they raced, scattering in all directions, to see who could first find a tender young carrot for Peter Rabbit. By and by, when one of them did find a field of tender young carrots, he rushed off, taking the smell of them with him to tickle the nose of Peter Rabbit. Peter wriggled his nose, his funny little nose, very fast when it was tickled with the smell of tender young carrots, and the merry little breeze laughed to see him. "'Come on, Peter Rabbit, for this is my busy day,' he cried. Peter Rabbit didn't have to be invited twice. Away he went lipperty lipperty lip as fast as his long legs could take him after the merry little breeze and presently they came to the field of tender young carrots oh thank you merry little breeze cried peter rabbit and straightway began to eat his breakfast another merry little breeze slipping up the crooked little path on the hill spied the hind legs of a fat beetle sticking out from under a flat stone at once the little breeze remembered jimmy skunk who was hunting for beetles for his breakfast. Off rushed the little breeze in merry whirls that made the grasses sway and bend and the daisies nod. When, after a long, long hunt, he found Jimmy Skunk, Jimmy was very much out of sorts. In fact, Jimmy Skunk was positively cross. You see, he hadn't had any breakfast, for hunt as he would, he couldn't find a single beetle. When the merry little breeze danced up behind Jimmy Skunk and, just in fun, rumpled up his black and white coat, Jimmy quite lost his temper. In fact, he said some things not at all nice to the merry little breeze. But the merry little breeze just laughed. The more he laughed, the crosser Jimmy Skunk grew. And the crosser Jimmy Skunk grew, the more the merry little breeze laughed. It was such a jolly laugh that pretty soon Jimmy Skunk began to grin a little sheepishly then to really smile, and finally to laugh outright in spite of his empty stomach. You see, it is very hard, very hard indeed, and very foolish, to remain cross when someone else is perfectly good-natured. Suddenly the merry little breeze danced up to Jimmy Skunk and whispered in his right ear. Then he danced around and whispered in his left ear. Jimmy Skunk's eyes snapped and his mouth began to water. Where, little breeze? Where? he begged. Follow me, cried the merry little breeze, racing off up the crooked little path so fast that Jimmy Skunk lost his breath trying to keep up, for you know Jimmy Skunk seldom hurries. When they came to the big flat stone, Jimmy Skunk grasped it with both hands and pulled and pulled. Up came the stone so suddenly that Jimmy Skunk fell over flat on his back. When he had scrambled to his feet, there were beetles and beetles running in every direction to find a place to hide. "'Thank you, thank you, little breeze,' shouted Jimmy Skunk, as he started to catch beetles for his breakfast. 
and the little breeze laughed happily as he danced away to join the other merry little breezes on the green meadows. There he found them very, very busy, very busy indeed, so busy that they could hardly find time to nod to him. What do you think they were doing? They were toting gold. Yes, sir, toting gold. And this is how it happened. While the first little breeze was showing Peter Rabbit the field of tender young carrots, and while the second little breeze was leading Jimmy Skunk to the flat stone and the beetles, the other merry little breezes had found Bumble the Bee. Now Bumble the Bee is a lazy fellow, though he pretends to be the busiest fellow in the world, and they found him grumbling as he buzzed with a great deal of fuss from one flower to another. "'What's the matter, Bumble?' cried the merry little breezes. "'Matter enough,' grumbled Bumble the Bee. "'I've got to make a sack of honey.' And if that isn't enough, old Mother Nature has ordered me to carry a sack of gold from each flower I visit to the next flower I visit. If I don't, I can get no honey. Buzz, 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 grumbled Bumble the Bee. The merry little breezes looked at the million little flowers on the green meadows, each waiting a sack of gold to give and a sack of gold to receive. Then they looked at each other and shouted happily, for they too would now be able to cry, Busy, busy, busy. From flower to flower they hurried, each with a bag of gold over his shoulder. Wherever they left a bag, they took a bag, and all the little flowers nodded happily to see the merry little breezes at work. Jolly, round, red Mr. Sun climbed higher and higher and higher in the blue sky, where he can look down and see all things, great and small. His smile was broader than ever as he watched the hurrying, scurrying little breezes working instead of playing. Yet after all it was a kind of play, for they danced from flower to flower and ran races across bare places where no flowers grew. By and by the merry little breezes met Peter Rabbit. Now Peter Rabbit had made a good breakfast of tender young carrots, so he felt very good, very good indeed. Hi, shouted Peter Rabbit, come play with me. Can't, cried the merry little breezes all together. We have work to do. Off they hurried, while Peter Rabbit stretched himself out full length in a sunny spot, for Peter Rabbit also is a lazy fellow. Down the crooked little path onto the green meadows came Jimmy Skunk. Ho! shouted Jimmy Skunk, as soon as he saw the little breezes. Come play with me. Can't, cried the little breezes, for we are busy, busy, busy and they laughed happily. When they reached the Laughing Brook, they found Billy Mink curled up in a round ball, fast asleep. It isn't often that Billy Mink is caught napping, but he had had a good breakfast of trout, he had found no one to play with, and, as he never works, and the day was so bright and warm, he had first looked for a place where he thought no one would find him, and had then curled himself up to sleep. One of the little breezes laid down the bag of gold he was carrying, and creeping ever so softly over to Billy Mink, began to tickle one of Billy's ears with a straw. At first Billy Mink didn't open his eyes, but rubbed his ear with a little black hand. Finally he jumped to his feet wide awake and ready to fight whoever was bothering him. But all he saw was a laughing little breeze running away with a bag of gold on his back. So all day long, till Old Mother West Wind came with her big bag to carry them to their home behind the purple hills, the merry little breezes hurried this way and that way over the green meadows. No wee flower was too tiny to give and receive its share of gold, and not one was overlooked by the merry little breezes. Old Mother Nature, who knows everything, heard of the busy day of the merry little breezes. Nobody knows how she heard of it. Perhaps jolly, round, red Mr. Sun told her. Perhaps, but never mind. You can't fool Old Mother Nature anyway, and it's of no use to try. So Old Mother Nature visited the green meadows to see for herself, and when she found how the merry little breezes had distributed the gold, she was so pleased that straightway she announced to all the world that thenceforth and for all time the merry little breezes of Old Mother West Wind should have charge of the distribution of the gold of the flowers on the green meadows, which they have to this day. And since that day the merry little breezes have been merrier than ever, for they have found that it is not nearly so much fun to play all the time, but that to work for some good in the world is the greatest fun of all. 
So every year when the gold of the flowers, which some people do not know is gold at all, but call pollen, is ready, you will find the merry little breezes of Old Mother West Wind very, very busy among the flowers on the green meadows. And this is the happiest time of all. End of chapter 13 14 of Mother West Wind's Children. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Mother West Wind's Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 14. Why Hooty the Owl Does Not Play on the Green Meadows. The merry little breezes of Old Mother West Wind were having a good night game of tag down on the green meadows. They were having such a jolly time while they waited for Old Mother West Wind and her big bag to take them to their home behind the purple hills. Jolly, round, red Mr. Sun had already put his nightcap on. Black shadows crept softly out from the purple hills onto the green meadows. The merry little breezes grew sleepy, almost too sleepy to play, for Old Mother West Wind was very, very late. Farther and farther and farther out onto the green meadows crept the black shadows. Suddenly one seemed to separate from the others. Softly, oh so softly, yet swiftly, it floated over towards the merry little breezes. One of them happened to look up and saw it coming. It was the same little breeze who one time stayed out all night. When he looked up and saw this seeming shadow moving so swiftly, he knew that it was no shadow at all. "'Here comes Hooty the Owl,' cried the little breeze. Then all the merry little breezes stopped their game of tag to look at Hooty the Owl. It is seldom they have a chance to see him, for usually Hooty the Owl does not come out on the green meadows until after the merry little breezes are snugly tucked in bed behind the purple hills. "'Perhaps Hooty the Owl will tell us why it is that he never comes out to play with us,' said one of the little breezes." But just as Hooty the Owl floated over to them, up came Old Mother West Wind, and she was in a great hurry, for she was late, and she was tired. She had had a busy day, a very busy day indeed, hunting for a rain cloud which had gone astray. So now she just opened her big bag and tumbled all the merry little breezes into it as fast as she could, without giving them so much as a chance to say good evening to Hooty the Owl. Then she took them off home behind the purple hills. Of course the Merry Little Breezes were disappointed, very much disappointed. But they were also very sleepy, for they had played hard all day. "'Never mind,' said one of them drowsily. "'Tomorrow we'll ask Great Grandfather Frog why it is that Hooty the Owl never comes out to play with us on the green meadows. He'll know.' The next morning Old Mother West Wind was late in coming down from the Purple Hills. When she finally did turn the Merry Little Breezes out of her big bag onto the green meadows, jolly, round, red Mr. Sun was already quite high in the blue sky. The Merry Little Breezes waited just long enough to say good-bye to Old Mother West Wind, and then started a mad race to see who could reach the Smiling Pool first. There they found Great Grandfather Frog sitting on his big green lily pad as usual. He was very contented with the world, was Grandfather Frog, for fat green flies had been more foolish than usual that morning, and already he had all that he could safely tuck inside his white and yellow waistcoat. "'Good morning, Grandfather Frog,' shouted the Merry Little Breezes. "'Will you tell us why it is that Hooty the Owl never comes out to play with us on the green meadows?' "'Chug a rum,' said Great Grandfather Frog gruffly. "'How should I know?' You see, Grandfather Frog likes to be teased a little. "'Oh, but you do know, for you are so old and so very wise,' cried the Merry Little Breezes altogether. Grandfather Frog smiled, for he likes to be thought very wise, and also he was feeling very good, very good indeed that morning. "'Chug a rum,' said Grandfather Frog. "'If you will sit perfectly still, I'll tell you what I know about Hooty the Owl. But remember, you must sit perfectly still, perfectly still.' The Merry Little Breezes sighed, for it is the hardest thing in the world for them to keep perfectly still, unless they are asleep. But they promised that they would, and when they had settled down, each one in the heart of a great white water lily, Grandfather Frog began. Once upon a time, when the world was young, 
Hooty the Owl's grandfather, a thousand times removed, used to fly about in daylight with the other birds. He was very big and very strong and very fierce, was Mr. Owl. He had great big claws and a hooked bill, just as Hooty the Owl has now, and he was afraid of nothing and nobody. Now when people are very big and very strong and afraid of nothing and nobody, they are very apt to care for nothing and nobody but themselves. So it was with Mr. Owl. Whatever he saw that he wanted, he took, no matter to whom it belonged, for there was no one to stop him. As I have already told you, Mr. Owl was very big and very strong and very fierce, and he was a very great glutton. It took a great many little birds and little animals to satisfy his appetite. But he didn't stop there. No, sir, he didn't stop there. He used to kill harmless little meadow people just for the fun of killing, and because he could. Every day he grew more savage. Finally, no one smaller than himself dared stir on the green meadows when he was around. The little birds no longer sang. The field mice children no longer played among the meadow grasses. Those were sad days, very sad days indeed on the green meadows, said Grandfather Frog with a sigh. At last, Old Mother Nature came to visit the green meadows, and she soon saw what a terrible state things were in. No one came to meet her, for, you see, no one dared to show himself for fear of fierce old Mr. Owl. Now I have told you that Mr. Owl was afraid of nothing and nobody, but this is not quite true for he was afraid, very much afraid, of old Mother Nature. When he saw her coming, he was sitting on top of a tall dead stump, and he at once tried to look very meek and very innocent. Old Mother Nature wasted no time. "'Where are all my little meadow people, and why do they not come to give me greeting?' demanded old Mother Nature of Mr. Owl. Mr. Owl bowed very low. "'I'm sure I don't know. I think they must all be taking a nap.' said he. Now you can't fool old Mother Nature, and it's of no use to try. No, sir, you can't fool old Mother Nature. She just looked at Mr. Owl, and she looked at the feathers and fur scattered about the foot of the dead stump. Mr. Owl stood first on one foot, and then on the other. He tried to look old Mother Nature in the face, but he couldn't. You see, Mr. Owl had a guilty conscience and a guilty conscience never looks anyone straight in the face. He did wish that Mother Nature would say something, did Mr. Owl, but she didn't. She just looked and looked and looked and looked straight at Mr. Owl. The longer she looked, the uneasier he got, and the faster he shifted from one foot to the other. Finally he shifted so fast that he seemed to be dancing on top of the old stump. Gradually, a few at a time, the little meadow people crept out from their hiding places and formed a great circle around the old dead stump. With old Mother Nature there, they felt sure that no harm could come to them. Then they began to laugh at the funny sight of fierce old Mr. Owl hopping from one foot to the other on top of the old dead stump. It was the first laugh on the green meadows for a long, long, long time. Of course Mr. Owl saw them laughing at him, but he could think of nothing but the sharp eyes of old Mother Nature boring straight through him, and he danced faster than ever. The faster he danced, the funnier he looked, and the funnier he looked, the harder the little meadow people laughed. Finally, old Mother Nature slowly raised a hand and pointed a long forefinger at Mr. Owl. All the little meadow people stopped laughing to hear what she would say. Mr. Owl, she began. I know and you know why none of my little meadow people were here to give me greeting. And this shall be your punishment. From now on your eyes shall become so tender that they cannot stand the light of day, so that hereafter you shall fly about only after round, red Mr. Sun has gone to bed behind the purple hills. No more shall my little people who play on the green meadows all the day long have cause to fear you, for no more shall you see to do them harm." When she ceased speaking, all the little meadow people gave a great shout, for they knew that it would be even as Mother Nature had said. Then began such a frolic as the green meadows had not known for many a long day. 
but Mr. Owl flew slowly and with difficulty over to the darkest part of the deep wood, for the light hurt his eyes dreadfully, and he could hardly see. And as he flew, the little birds flew around him in a great cloud, and plucked out his feathers, and tormented him, for he could not see to harm them. Grandfather Frog paused and looked dreamily across the smiling pool. Suddenly he opened his big mouth, and then closed it with a snap. One more foolish green fly had disappeared inside the white and yellow waistcoat. Chug-a-rum, said Grandfather Frog. Those were sad days, sad days indeed for Mr. Owl. He couldn't hunt for his meals by day, for the light blinded him. At night he could see but little in the darkness. So he got little to eat, and he grew thinner and thinner and thinner, until he was but a shadow of his former self. He was always hungry, was Mr. Owl, always hungry. No one was afraid of him now, for it was the easiest thing in the world to keep out of his way. At last Old Mother Nature came again to visit the green meadows and the green forest. Far, far in the darkest part of the deep wood she found Mr. Owl. When she saw how very thin and how very, very miserable he was, her heart was moved to pity, for Old Mother Nature loves all her subjects, even the worst of them. All the fierceness was gone from Mr. Owl. He was so weak that he just sat huddled in the thickest part of the great pine. You see, he had been able to catch very little to eat. Mr. Owl, said Old Mother Nature gently, you now know something of the misery and the suffering which you have caused others, and I think you have been punished enough. No more may you fly abroad over the green meadows while the day is bright, for still is the fear of you in the hearts of all my little meadow people. But hereafter you shall not find it so difficult to get enough to eat. Your eyes shall grow big, bigger than the eyes of any other bird, so that you shall be able to see in the dusk and even in the dark. Your ears shall grow large, larger than the ears of any of the little forest or meadow people, so that you can hear the very least sound. Your feathers shall become as soft as down, so that when you fly none shall hear you. And from that day it was even so. Mr. Owl's eyes grew big and bigger, until he could see as well in the dusk as he used to see in the full light of day. His ears grew large and larger, until his hearing became so keen that he could hear the least rustle, even at a long distance. And when he flew he made no sound, but floated like a great shadow. The little meadow people no longer feared him by day, but when the shadows began to creep out from the purple hills each night, and they heard his voice, hoo to hoo 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 they felt all the old fear of him. If they were wise, they did not stir, but if they were foolish and so much as shivered, Mr. Owl was sure to hear them and silently pounce upon them. So once more Mr. Owl grew strong and fierce, but only at night had any one cause to fear him, and then only the foolish and timid. And now you know, concluded Grandfather Frog, why it is that Hooty the Owl never comes out to play with you on the green meadows, and why his eyes are so big and his ears so large. Thank you, thank you, Grandfather Frog, cried the Merry Little Breezes, springing up from the white water lilies and stretching themselves. We'll bring you the first foolish green fly we can find. Then away they rushed to hunt for it. End of chapter 14《Of Mother West Wind's Children》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden.《Mother West Wind's Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 15. Danny Meadow Mouse Learns to Laugh. Danny Meadow Mouse sat on his doorstep and sulked. The merry little breezes of old Mother West Wind ran past, one after another, and, pointing their fingers at him, cried, "'Fie, Danny Meadow Mouse! Better go inside the house!' Babies cry, oh my, oh my, you're a baby, go and cry. Pretty soon along the lone little path came Peter Rabbit. Peter Rabbit looked at Danny Meadow Mouse. Then he pointed a finger at him and said, Cry, Danny, cry, Mammy will whip you by and by, then we'll all come round to see how big a baby you can be. Cry, Danny, cry. 
Danny Meadow Mouse began to snivel. He cried softly to himself as Peter Rabbit hopped off down the lone little path. Soon along came Reddy Fox. He saw Danny Meadow Mouse sitting on his doorstep crying all by himself. Reddy Fox crept up behind a tall bunch of grass. Then suddenly he jumped out right in front of Danny Meadow Mouse. Boo! cried Reddy Fox. It frightened Danny Meadow Mouse. He jumped almost out of his skin and ran into the house crying at the top of his voice. Ha ha ha! laughed Reddy Fox. Danny, Danny, crying Dan, boo hoo hooed, and off he ran. Then Reddy Fox chased his tail all the way down the lone little path onto the green meadows. By and by, Danny Meadow Mouse came out again and sat on his doorstep. He had stopped crying, but he looked very unhappy and cross and sulky. Hopping and skipping down the lone little path came Striped Chipmunk. "'Come play with me,' called Danny Meadow Mouse. Striped Chipmunk kept right on hopping and skipping down the lone little path. "'Don't want to,' said Striped Chipmunk, sticking his tongue in his cheek. "'Cry, baby Danny, never'll be a manny. Run to Mama, Danny dear, and she will wipe away your tear.' Striped Chipmunk hopped and skipped out of sight, and Danny Meadow Mouse began to cry again because Striped Chipmunk would not play with him. It was true, dreadfully true. Danny Meadow Mouse was a crybaby, and no one wanted to play with him. If he stubbed his toe, he cried. If Striped Chipmunk beat him in a race, he cried. If the Merry Little Breezes pulled his whiskers just in fun, he cried. It had come to such a pass that all the little meadow people delighted to tease him, just to make him cry. Nowhere on all the green meadows was there such a crybaby as Danny Meadow Mouse. So Danny sat on his doorstep and cried because no one would play with him, and he was lonely. The more he thought how lonely he was, the more he cried. Presently along came old Mr. Toad. Now Mr. Toad looks very grumpy and out of sorts, but that is because you do not know old Mr. Toad. When he reached the house of Danny Meadow Mouse, he stopped right in front of Danny. He put his right hand behind his right ear and listened. Then he put his left hand behind his left ear and listened some more. Finally he put both hands on his hips and began to laugh. Now Mr. Toad's mouth is very big indeed, and when he opens it to laugh, he opens it very wide indeed. Ha ha ha, ha ha ha, laughed Mr. Toad. Danny Meadow Mouse cried harder than ever, and the harder he cried, the harder old Mr. Toad laughed. By and by, Danny Meadow Mouse stopped crying long enough to say to Mr. Toad, "'What are you laughing for, Mr. Toad?' Mr. Toad stopped laughing long enough to reply, "'I'm laughing, Danny Meadow Mouse, because you are crying at me. What are you crying for?' "'I'm crying,' said Danny Meadow Mouse, "'because you are laughing at me.' Then Danny began to cry again, and Mr. Toad began to laugh again. "'What's all this about?' demanded someone right behind them. It was Jimmy Skunk. "'It's a new kind of game,' said old Mr. Toad. "'Danny Meadow Mouse is trying to see if he can cry longer than I can laugh.' Then old Mr. Toad once more opened his big mouth and began to laugh harder than ever. Jimmy Skunk looked at him for just a minute, and he looked so funny that Jimmy Skunk began to laugh too. Now a good honest laugh is like whooping cough. It is catching. The first thing Danny Meadow Mouse knew, his tears would not come. It's a fact Danny Meadow Mouse had run short of tears. The next thing he knew, he wasn't crying at all. He was laughing. Yes, sir, he actually was laughing. He tried to cry, but it was of no use at all. He just had to laugh. The more he laughed, the harder old Mr. Toad laughed. And the harder Mr. Toad laughed, the funnier he looked. Pretty soon all three of them, Danny Meadow Mouse, old Mr. Toad, and Jimmy Skunk, were holding their sides and rolling over and over in the grass they were laughing so hard. By and by Mr. Toad stopped laughing. "'Dear me, dear me,' 
This will never do, said Mr. Toad. I must get busy in my garden. The little slugs, they creep and crawl, and eat and eat from spring to fall. They never stop to laugh nor cry, and really couldn't if they'd try. So if you'll excuse me, I'll hurry along to get them out of my garden. Mr. Toad started down the lone little path. After a few hops, he paused and turned around. Danny Meadow Mouse, said old Mr. Toad, an honest laugh is like sunshine. It brightens the whole world. Don't forget it. Jimmy Skunk remembered that he had started out to find some beetles, so still chuckling, he started for the crooked little path up the hill. Danny Meadow Mouse, once more alone, sat down on his doorstep. His sides were sore, he had laughed so hard. And somehow the whole world had changed. The grass seemed greener than he had ever seen it before. The sunshine was brighter, and the songs of the birds were sweeter. Altogether, it was a very nice world, a very nice world indeed to live in. Somehow he felt as if he never wanted to cry again. Pretty soon along came the Merry Little Breezes again, chasing butterflies. When they saw Danny Meadow Mouse sitting on his doorstep, they pointed their fingers at him just as before and shouted, Fie, Danny Meadow Mouse, better go inside the house. Babies cry, oh my, oh my, you're a baby, go and cry. For just a little minute, Danny Meadow Mouse wanted to cry. Then he remembered old Mr. Toad, and instead began to laugh. The Merry Little Breezes didn't know just what to make of it. They stopped chasing butterflies and crowded around Danny Meadow Mouse. They began to tease him. They pulled his whiskers and rumpled his hair. The more they teased, the more Danny Meadow Mouse laughed. When they found that Danny Meadow Mouse really wasn't going to cry, they stopped teasing and invited him to come play with them in the long meadow grass. Such a good frolic as they did have. When it was over, Danny Meadow Mouse once more sat down on his doorstep to rest. Hopping and skipping back up the lone little path came Striped Chipmunk. When he saw Danny Meadow Mouse, he stuck his tongue in his cheek and cried, Cry, baby Danny, never'll be a manny. Run to Mama, Danny dear, and she will wipe away your tear. Instead of crying, Danny Meadow Mouse began to laugh. Striped Chipmunk stopped and took his tongue out of his cheek. Then he began to laugh, too. Do you want me to play with you? asked Striped Chipmunk suddenly. Of course Danny did and soon they were having the merriest kind of a game of hide-and-seek. Right in the midst of it, Danny Meadow Mouse caught his left foot in a root and twisted his ankle. My, how it did hurt! In spite of himself, tears did come into his eyes. But he winked them back and bravely began to laugh. Striped Chipmunk helped him back to his doorstep and cut funny capers while Mother Meadow Mouse bound up the hurt foot. And all the time Danny Meadow Mouse laughed, until pretty soon he forgot that his foot ached at all. When Peter Rabbit came jumping along up the lone little path, he began to shout as soon as he saw Danny Meadow Mouse. Cry, Danny, cry, Mammy'll whip you by and by, then we'll all come round to see how big a baby you can be. Cry, Danny, cry. But Danny didn't cry. My, no, he laughed instead. Peter Rabbit was so surprised that he stopped to see what had come over Danny Meadow Mouse. When he saw the bandaged foot and heard how Danny had twisted his ankle, Peter Rabbit sat right down on the doorstep beside Danny Meadow Mouse and told him how sorry he was, for happy-go-lucky Peter Rabbit is very tender-hearted. Then he told Danny all about the wonderful things he had seen in his travels and of all the scrapes he had gotten into. When Peter Rabbit finally started off home, Danny Meadow Mouse still sat on his doorstep. But no longer was he lonely. He watched Old Mother West Wind trying to gather her merry little breezes into her big bag to take to their home behind the Purple Hills. And he laughed right out when he saw her catch the last mischievous little breeze and tumble him, heels over head, in with the others. Old Mr. Toad was right, just exactly right, thought Danny Meadow Mouse, as he rocked to and fro on his doorstep. It is much better, oh, very much better, to laugh than to cry. 
and since that day when Danny Meadow Mouse learned to laugh, no one has had a chance to point a finger at him and call him a crybaby. Instead, everyone has learned to love merry little Danny Meadow Mouse, and now they call him Laughing Dan. End of chapter 15 End of Mother West Wind's Children by Thornton W. Burgess